Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and today we are looking at a golden example of the fact that not all heroes wear capes because this is the Mark 1 Ford Focus Project C170 which absolutely and definitively changed the game and raised expectations of what a mid-size family car should be like, how it should look, how it should handle, how the interior should be built. This thing single-handedly changed everyone's mind about cheap motoring for the better. Now Project C170 had begun in the early 1990s to replace the Escort which was, let's be honest, lacklustre at best, pretty hopeless at worst. It was feeling tired, outdated, people weren't buying it unless they were absolute Ford diehards or the dealer was discounting it ridiculously heavily. It was also a victim of Ford's cost-cutting exercises to try and save money on the production line by trimming back in the product, and people had voted with their feet that they did not like that. The focus had to be something special, and it really, really was. And when it first appeared in 1998, it left people gobsmacked. 25 odd years on, it's easy to forget just how genuinely shocking the look of this thing was. There was nothing else like it. The new edge design, the difference in the packaging, everything about it was just literally shocking. There's no other word. To go from the bland and forgettable Mark 6 Escort, and I challenge you to try and remember what one looks like right now, I bet you can't, to a Mark 1 Focus, which is now so commonplace and so ordinary, you don't give it a second thought. But in 1998, this was the world, well, the sun had crashed into the earth, the moon was on fire, this was devastatingly good or possibly bad, depending on your point of view, because that new edge design was definitely Marmite. Some people loved it, some people hated it, but then that is always the shock of the new. Sometimes things take a little bit of getting used to, and over the years, people really have got much more used to it and don't really mind it anymore, it just blends in with everything else. And in fact, a lot of the uh, design language and design cues that were part of the Focus have now become very normal indeed. Now, one interesting carryover is because people were so fed up of the Escort, Ford early on decided they wanted to change the name and Focus was the name of a concept car from the early 90s. However, a German uh, publishing company had a magazine with the name Focus and they took them to court. Luckily, in the 11th hour, Ford managed to overturn that judgment and get things sorted out. Now often it's the car designers who take all the credit and that's where all the headlines lie. But in the case of Ford and Fords of this era, the real star of the show was Richard Parry Jones, one of my motoring heroes, the guy behind the Puma, the Ford KA, the original Mondeo. He was one of the best chassis engineers ever to have walked this planet. And he was behind making this car, which was at its heart, a budget friendly, mid-sized family hack, one of the greatest cars on the road you can drive. Because what he didn't understand about chassis dynamics isn't worth knowing, and he would push his team hard, but not in a way they resented. He was someone who was liked by his co-workers and got the best out of them, and so they went through everything. They eliminated what they call stiction, which is friction and sticking in suspension components. So everything moves very smoothly and freely and flowingly under the car. And normally on a car like this, you'd have independent front suspension, which we have got here, but then we'd have trailing arms because they are compact and they are cheap. This used what Ford called control blade technology, which was really rather clever. It was a development of the suspension that they used in the new Mondeo estate, but they simplified it and cheapened it to make it accessible on a more mass market car than the fairly niche Mondeo estate. And the genius of the control blade was that it took up the space of a trailing arm, didn't cost much more, and had the control of a multi-link double wishbone set up. Really, really innovative, really, really clever, and again, lots of stiction removed, so the thing just flows over. And plus a very stiff body shell, and very well worked out spring rates, damper rates, so the car just flows over bumps. It's got incredible body control and noise 
and vibration harshness reduction is just completely isolated from the cabin. It isolates you as if you were in something like a body on frame car, but it handles like a sports car. It's, it's a revelation. There's nothing, there's no other word for it. It was a limousine when you wanted it to be that, and it was a sports car when you wanted that. It was the perfect all-rounder, really was good. So we've seen what makes it so good underneath the skin. Let's pull over and have a quick look at why it was so shocking on the outside. So, climbing out and looking at the exterior of the Focus, you can see why it caused such a stir when the public got their first sight of it, because it was like nothing else they'd seen before. Ford's new image design had made a glimmer of an appearance with some more sporty cars. However, on a mainstream car that was replacing the relentlessly dull Escort, this was, it was a revelation. Minds were blown. New Edge Design took all these elements of geometric shapes, flowing curves, sharp angles, and pushed them together to make something that really shouldn't work, but absolutely does. And it was a love it or hate it thing. And I've got to say, I love it. And I have done since the moment I saw it. Speaking of things that I love, that shirt I'm wearing, you say, yes, yes, this is my Rustaville hoodie. And yes, you can get one for yourself. Just head over to rustaville.co.uk. Wear it to the show in a couple of weeks time. And there's a variety of options to pre-order and collect on the day at Rustaville. But be warned, pre-orders close tonight. So get over to rustaville.co.uk as soon as you finish watching this video. Just throw that out there. Anyway, back to the car. So although there were four different body styles, there was the hatchback available in a three and a five door, there was the estate car, and of course there was the saloon, the one that works best and is the most native New Edge style is the hatchback, whether it's three or five doors, the way that the windows taper back into this sharp point and the tail lights rise up, it just works so brilliantly. It's a wonderful, wonderful bit of design work. New Edge had originated with Jack Telnack and Claude Lobo, and they were from Ford Global. However, it was Australian John Doughty who did the actual design work in the European offices. And wow, what a job he did. It is such an amazing piece of design. Normally on any car, there would be a point somewhere where things just don't quite add up, where they could run out of time, patience, talent. In this case, everything just flows from one place to the next to the next. The way these lines appear over the rear arches, flow into this trim swage line and flow out again over the front arches, it's just magnificent. That's just one of many design elements that makes cars so good. Looking around inside the car, you'll find that They've just done a very clever bit of packaging to make the H point of the car, the point where your hips sit, very high indeed. And in fact, the entire packaging of the entire interior is very spacious. They raised the roof line internally, so you've got loads of headroom. They've pushed the doors out. They've actually given it very, very tall, almost SUV-like doors down here as well, so that you know, you've got an easy access to climb into this amazing interior. This car did come with leather seats as standard, but it has got the ST Recaros fitted uh, subsequently. However, it's not that different. It just feels a little bit nicer. And this car was loaded from new. This is a two liter ZTEC. It's got all the toys. So the thing that really strikes you as you climb in is this dashboard because the new Edge design has gone absolutely everywhere over the top inside this car. So we've got this long, so we've got this long flowing organic swoop which starts in the passenger door, curves across the passenger side of the dashboard, slashes across the shiny top part here in the dashboard, and that becomes a descending curve. That's like a little round semicircle down there. We've got these oval ellipses for the uh, air vents, and they rotate in a quite unusual manner as well. And they're scattered seemingly haphazardly, but no, there's, there is method to this. So we've been worked out the golden triangle would have been used to work out precisely where to put them. Then even the airbag is this lovely geometric shape. It's got a huge big T-shelf, very handy indeed. And then the binnacle of the uh, instruments themselves, that is another big organic curve which flows out of the dashboard. It looks like a, an eye blinking at you out of the dash. We've got a slightly out of place, tiny square LCD clock and temperature gauge up here on the left. Then we've got our intersecting dials. Everything is just flowing from one thing to the next. So you'll notice how you've got a, a bubble row of warning lights on the left. Your temperature flows in to the taco, which is then bisected by the speedo, which flows into the temperature gauge. It's lovely and it all just bubbles around here to the right hand side, where once again, we've got another curving line, which flows across into the door. It's just an amazing piece of design. Everything just, I say, flows. Geometric shapes into circles, and nothing looks like it should go together, but somehow it does. In the center of this one, we've got this rather nice 
almost a wood grain effect under the plastic. Digital clock up there. We've got a large radio, sort of Ford specific, with a six disc in-dash player, which is awesome. Curious location for the ashtray just there, which slides out and again, it's weirdly shaped. And our power outlet, not listed as a cigarette lighter, but a power outlet just there. Our climate control, little circles. Underneath we've got the most useless little small shape just down here for putting things. Two cup holders, magnificently a five speed gearbox. Manual, lovely, and it's a great thing to use. Heated front seats, traction control on these big textured buttons. This was a world car, so some of the buttons do feel kind of big and chunky because Ford America. Proper handbrake, which is wonderful. And of course, we've got another cup holder in the back with a little bit of wobbling storage. Only one cup holder for the rear. A quick glance at the door itself, and it's a very nicely appointed door. Up on the A pillar, we've got the same mirror switch we'll find in every Ford from the 90s and early noughties. You've seen that in the Mark on Mondeo and many others. Nice little curved window switches, all four electric. A big, big speaker uh, cover just there. Got a big oval speaker underneath that. Continuing the curving theme, this door handle flows on from the shape of its surround into the, the recess itself. Nice bit of chrome, good sort of door handle. And being the uh, high spec car, we have actually got the perforated leather as well. This is very nice indeed. I will also mention the owner, who is the same owner of a couple of cars we've done before. You might remember the Signum and the Nova, which had the perfectly accessorised period mobile phones, and this even has a Palm Pilot. How cool is that? And finally in the front, just look how chunky the steering wheel is. It's big and comfy and leather perforated. Oh, it's fabulous. And of course, we've got the horn test. Oh, that's a pop which is looking to the future and it's getting there in a hurry. Climbing into the back and we can see this lovely little gear badge on the C post. Again, very tall doors, very easy access, big square opening, so it's really easy to get in. Climb aboard, nice leather again, and we've got another power outlet down here. So this car is absolutely loaded with all the good stuff to make your life as comfortable as possible. A second light in the back. Don't forget, the Escort was austerity personified. This though, is just loaded with extras. You've got map pockets in the back of the seats. You've got lumbar support in the front seats. You've got decent speakers, you've got handles, everything. It's such a nice place to be and so much headroom. That practicality does extend into the boot where it is absolutely enormous. Now bear in mind, this car is a 2002 and it came out in 1998. So it ran concurrently with my Alpha 145, which I actually drove to the shoot in today. The boot in this car is probably double the size of that of the Alpha. It is absolutely, well, huge. Considering the size of the car, the packaging is just astonishing. It's so, so good. A ton of room and, and underneath this Velcro down carpet, there is actually a proper spare wheel. And those seats fold down 60-40 as well. Just practical all day. Do you even need the estate? Well, possibly you do, you might have dogs. I don't know. And of course, marking the car as a newer car rather than a fully retro car, we've got handles to pull it down. Only downgrade here is there's no actual button on the boot to open the lid with. Now, one little quirk of Fords of this era is to get into the bonnet, you need to take your ignition key, fold the budge away, and then you can get in that way. Now under the bonnet you had a choice of many engines. They used the uh, ZTEC, which is still a new and exciting engine in the late 90s. You had a 1.4, a 1.6, a 1.8, and a two liter, all in ZTEC form. There's also the two liter Duratec, which is variable valve timing and was used in the ST. This is the two liter ZTEC, and it is a pokey beast. It's, it's about 143 horsepower, nought to 60, is nine and a bit seconds. It's pretty respectable times. Not quite high hatch, but not far off. There were also a couple of two litre diesels through the car's life as well. If I'm being honest, the 1.4, that's a bit too gutless. Well, a lot too gutless, really. The 1.6, a bit too gutless. The two litre, brisk, but a bit on the thirsty side. The sweet spot, really, for everyday use is the 1.8. It's only a second slower to 60, but gives better MPG. 123 horsepower in a car that weighs 1163 kilograms. That's nothing to worry about really, is it? And this is what you've got to forget. Cars of this era were light. So you might be thinking, oh my God, 150 horsepower in the best version, the Gear 2 litre. What were they on? What were they thinking? Yeah, it doesn't weigh four tons. It was properly light. So there was an engine for everyone. There's also a gearbox for everyone. There was a variety of five-speed gearboxes through the car's life. There was a six-speed manual later on. And of course, there was a four-speed automatic if you don't like yourself for some reason. So yeah, we are covering all bases. And of course, there were body styles, three-door and five-door hatchbacks, which as I say, just look 
absolutely the business. And it's a shame three-door hatchbacks uh, are being kind of written out of history by car manufacturers who are rationalizing production because they do look so good. Look at my Alpha 145 and the 200 VI. Both look fantastic as three doors. Anyway, as well as that, there was the practical estate car, which was absolutely fabulous if you needed to shift stuff in a hurry. And of course, there was also the saloon, which really was aimed at the American market. Here initially, because it was trying to take the place of the higher pegged Orions, they only sold it as a gear trim. But later on, when no one was buying it, they did bring other trims as well because they needed to shift a few. That saloon was really intended mostly for the American market because this car was Ford's third and finally successful attempt at a world car. They tried previously with the Mark III Escort and the Mark I Mondeo, but in both cases, when they got to North America, Ford of USA had just gone completely their own way and re-engineered it so drastically it couldn't be considered a world car anymore because it bore very little resemblance to the car it started with. This time though, Ford Global wanted something that was actually going to be a global car. It was engineered across Ford Europe, mostly in Ford Germany and Ford UK, with some very talented people doing a lot of amazing work. And again, I cannot emphasize what a shock this car was when it came out. But it was a shock in a good way because it wasn't long before all the competitors started freshening up their designs and stealing some version of control blade in the back of the car to make their cars ride better as well. This car, it may not look exciting in to today's eyes where everything is angles and sharp edges and creases and bright LEDs. This was stunning. And people often ask me, what is a future classic I should be collecting? This, I'm sitting in it right now. It doesn't get more future classic than this. Everyone's family had one. Someone in your family had a Mark 1 Focus or they rented one on holiday or a neighbor had one or you went to school in one. This is where the nostalgia lies. These were brilliant cars and they sold like hotcakes. It won European Car of the Year. It won all the different magazines Car of the Years. It is just one of the best cars ever built and it just flies completely under the radar because there were so many of them and because it's just a small family Ford, it's just overlooked, but it's too good to overlook. It is one of the best cars you will ever get the chance to drive. If you sit in a Focus, you will love it. I have a list of cars which are, when I get my bigger barn, I'm going to squirrel one away. I am going to squirrel one away, these away. Whether it's an original S-plate one, which is the ultimate super rare original first year of, of sale cars, which are very thin on the ground, but slightly flawed because first year of production always has a few issues to sort out. Or whether I go for one of the more exciting, which is probably more my thing, ST-170s from 2002, is anyone's guess. I just need to get the barn first. But this is such a good car. Just driving along at 40 miles an hour or so, it is perfectly refined, so comfortable. And you feel so safe, you've got airbags everywhere. You've got a stiff body shell, you've got seat belt pretensioners, ABS, and of course, the passive safety of a car that isn't gonna let you crash easily. You've gotta try and crash it. I have loved driving this car. So thank you for letting me out in the car today, Darren. I've loved every second. And join me again next time driving something completely different. Mm -hmm.